Well done, you guys going. So, uh, we welcome Ami yeah. at work. Uh, he is, uh, was at San Diego just a couple of times with the folks there, and uh, he's a professor at the University of Connecticut. Uh, he, I met uh, Amir actually. Uh, Amir was my introduction to cryptography. So uh, I was a student at uh, MIT, I was an undergraduate, and I was lucky to get an internship with the IBM, and uh, where Amir was managing a security cryptography group, and he introduced me to uh, crypto, and I wrote my first paper. He was, you know, uh, kind to share his idea, and I was just like, oh, I see, okay, very well, I will try to write it down and understand what this is all about. So that was, um, you know, um, my beginning. Oh, thank you, Amir. And uh, he managed the IBM uh, Crypto Security Group uh, in Future Watson, New York, then he went to um, Israel, uh, where he was uh, continuing working for IBM, and he was a professor at Bar Ilan uh, University, and then moved to uh, Connecticut. He's a long story career with uh, all sorts of crypto security um, issues. And he's also an author of a textbook uh, in the area. So, um, <laughs> the textbook was very, it's not yet published, so it's not yet. But you're all very, well, very welcome to come to my website, download it, send me comments. I'm supposed to finish it finally for this. Okay. And I also have a long history with Gene. He was also in IBM, also in the Zurich camp. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to, to be here and to see my old friends and to uh, see all of you guys. All right, and let me get to the issue directly. Okay, so this talk is about actually more about uh, internet security than about uh, crypto. We do use a bit crypto, but just in a very kind of classical use of cryptography. So if you're more interested in cryptography, well, I guess maybe bear with me and you'll see some implications at least of cryptography, right? Uh, so there is still an interesting question of how do you actually prove security of such a flight cryptographic protocols? which is another interesting subject that I do work about, but again, not in this talk. So uh, this is joint work with my student, Cameron Morris, and with uh, my colleague, Jim Wang, also from UConn, and with, with my ex-colleague, Sam Kukonji. And the subject is DDPISEC, improved security of internet routing against post hour grid attacks, and all of that is actually not really anything for you. I will try to make them clear what is DDP, uh, and so on, so we don't have much time. But I'll do it. I'll try to still give you some background because they feel maybe we don't have much for this guy. So, internet routing. Internet routing is a huge challenge uh, because the internet is large. And not just it's not just a large network, it's a large network which does not have a single organization who is managing the entire network. That makes it much more complex. And not only do we don't have one manager, one organization managing it, we actually have it different organizations with different competing or conflicting interests. So it, it, it is a problem to even decide what do we want for routing to do. So it has about 80,000 independently managed organizations, which we call autonomous systems or the name sometimes, which are mostly for profit, some are non-profit, but they are mostly for profit organization, each of them managing a part of the network, and somehow it works together amazingly enough. It has two basic uh, trans or, or not trans data protocols, connectivity protocols, IPv version 4 and IPv version 6, which uh, uh, the addresses are used to route information to get to each computer. Each computer will have an, IP, an address IPv4 6. So we have over a million of these IPv4 uh, uh, prefixes. The prefix is a connection of addresses which are all have the same beginning, the same prefix, so that's why we call it prefix, and we can route to this prefix. So all of the computers sharing the same beginning of their address are in the same network uh, location, basically. So we use it, and each of these prefixes are owned by a particular organization, which is AES, Autonomous System. So we have over a million of these IPv4 prefixes are in use, about 200,000 IPv6 prefixes, 
uh, announce by different origins, so it's like a prefix origin there. And everything can change. The topology of the network can change. Uh, ownership of prefixes can change. Who is announcing a prefix where which uh, autonomous system is actually the, the place where a specific prefix you should send packets to. All of that can change over time. The routing is coordinated between all of these ASs, each with their own goals. Now, the most basic goal is to provide good service to the customers, maximize your revenue, minimize your cost, the costs which are usually for profit organization. And it's kind of a free market economy, no centralized planning, no centralized control over this network. The way that this is all happening is a protocol which is defined by the IEDF, the Energy Engineering Task Force, which is which they separate the routing between different autonomous systems, which we also call inter AS routing and routing within each autonomous system. So each, if you manage one of these autonomous systems, you can route inside your network pretty much the way you want, but we define a protocol for how all of these networks can operate with each other. And that is the border gateway protocol BGP. So that's, this is well defined for many years already, right? And uh, it's a huge challenge, but security for this is an even larger challenge in a sense, because we have all of that. And each of these other system can select their own policies for routing based on the, their own incentives. So how does it even work together? It works by having everybody respect some basic BGP rules. And the basic rules are, you should only announce the prefixes that you have, that you own, or if you receive some, some announcement from somebody else, you can relay it. So you can, you, you can, should not say that you own a, an IP address, which you don't. Makes sense, right? And if you do receive a, an announcement of some prefix from somebody else, and you send it over, you decide to send it over, you should not change it in uh, except for saying that it also goes to you. But you should not change some attributes in it and so on. You should preserve its integrity. And there is also a tricky kind of rule, uh, which is what we call usually value-free routing. And I simplify things a bit so people who know the term simply don't uh, see me. Uh, so basically saying that you should only maximize your profits, minimize your cost, <coughs> and maximize the connectivity for yourself and your customers, you should not announce some announcement just to get traffic, which is not for you, not to stuff to somehow disrupt the connectivity of other people. Makes sense, right? So your motivation should be to make profit is fine, to minimize your cost, sure, and to get maximize your connectivity to yourself and your customers. That's all makes sense. That's what you are supposed to be doing. Do, do not announce for other reasons. BGP attacks are basically the forbidden behaviors where you are modifying the announcement you receive, you are announcing something is not yours, stuff like that. That will be an attack. Yes. What oh. about squelching announcements? Refusing to make that's also a trick. Actually, you're you're not you the protocol does not tell you to you have to announce it for them. You don't have to. So squelching announcement is actually fine. It's your prerogative to say. I don't want to provide service to this guy. It's actually allowed. This is allowed. So you can essentially advertise a route to one neighbor, but not to the other, even though- You're allowed to do, not only you're allowed, that's actually a very common behavior. Yes, yes. By the way, Gene is giving all of you guys an example. I'm sure that some of you guys are students. So he's giving you a personal example of asking questions, okay? Please do ask questions. Gene knows me. I forgot to tell all of you guys, I love questions and please don't keep them to the end. If you have questions, ask them while we are talking. On the other end, uh, Gene is stuck. If you see me wasting too much time answering questions, remind me to tell people we can talk later. Right? Because I, I tend to get great. I love my job. <laughs> okay, so now there's been uh, so much work on this because it's such a basic point. I will not go over all this history. I'm just, actually, I wouldn't even do this uh, crazy timeline. It's a lot of work, but uh, Cameron has done this. Uh, yeah, so I'm keeping it, but I, we will not go over this because there's been so much work on BGP security. The basic situation is there, there's been a lot of work because attacks on BGP security are happening all the time. This is not something theoretical. And yet, and this protocol has been around for, you know, for ages, before most of you guys have been born, right? 
and and uh, it is its insecurity has been where and where. Only again, before you were born, people were only worried about his security, but it is still insecure. So that's a big problem, okay? So and there have been some progress, as you see, over the years. We have pointed some of the interesting events, in particular, let me point out this one. Right? In 2017, right, about seven years ago, the IETF, the same IETF, has, uh, has defined a standard called BGPSEC, which is a standard which is trying to basically solve the security problems of BGP. <laughs> and, uh, but if you remember, the, the title was BGP ISA. So our, what we are presenting is an attempt to actually improve the protocol or make it actually deployable and, and effective. Because most people in, in the area basically think that the, that protocol will never be adopted. Uh, okay, and we talk a bit about that. So let's talk, let's get into the problems. And uh, I mentioned it's fairly free routing, but maybe I will explain it a bit more because that, that is something important. Uh, so, how does it, what are the kind of policies that, that we expect legitimate policies for ASF to do? Uh, by the way, guys, uh, you, I will share the presentation with you at this point somewhere, I think, or whatever. I'll share it with uh, the professors here, and they can share it with you in whatever way, so you don't have to. Okay, so routing policy is normally in open terms like this. You first prefer routes that will maximize your, your profit. So if you got a route from a customer, which is great, I can send it to everybody, and then if people send traffic, then the customer is paying it. By the way, customers pay the providers for traffic that they send to the provider as well for traffic that the provider sends to them. So you end up paying both ways, right? So the provider is happy for you to get a lot of traffic as well as for you to send a lot of traffic, okay? So you prefer, if you have a route one, you receive one route to the same prefix from a customer, one from a provider, of course you will prefer the one from the customer because the customer is paying you while you are paying the provider. Uh, if you don't have a route for some prefix announced from a customer, but you got a route from uh, from providers and peers, then you will, you will prefer you will, the second best will be to use a route from your peers. Here is somebody that you just have disagreement with. I will route traffic to you. You will route traffic to me. We don't pay each other. We just you know, cooperate, right? So of course it's better than paying your provider. And, but if you don't have any choice and you got an announcement from some customer from a provider only you are not going to ignore it because you do want to have maximize your connectivity. So you are still going to use it if you don't have any other choice. Uh, if you have two announcements which are from the same relationship, you normally prefer the shortest one. The one with less ASs, kind of assuming that hopefully it has some relationship to efficiency, although it's not always, <laughs> but that's basically, that. these are the typical BGP policies. Now, what about sending announcements? which is like genius asset, exactly what it is. Yeah. The question, what about sending announcements? So you are not expected necessarily to send every announcement you receive. Actually, usually you will not do it. What you are normally expected is to spot announcements which you receive from your customers to everybody, uh, but actually you don't have to announce to everybody, I, you, but you can announce, for, announce it from your customers. You are, you may announce it to all of your networks you're connected to. And uh, um, if you, the best announcement is from a peer or provider, you don't have an announcement from a customer, but you have an announcement from a peer or provider, you will still export it, but only to your customers. Why? Because the customer will pay you. So you don't mind paying your provider since the customer will be paying you, right? So it's okay if you get traffic for, uh, from a provider. Okay, here is an example. So S1 is the origin, the, which I denote as this double circle, is the origin of this prefix, 120016. This last 16 means that the address, the prefix is the first 16 bits. So one is actually, you know, six, eight bits, right? So it's zero, 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 001, and two is again eight bits. So together we have 16 bits. That is the prefix, the network address, all the addresses which begin with one, two, and then any two, uh, numbers, they will be within this prefix. So this is the prefix assigned to this AS, owned by this AS. 
So they are announcing it, sending a BGP announcement, giving the prefix, we skip the zero zeros because this is a classic thing since we only look at the two first numbers anyway. So they send this announcement to AS2 and say, oh, and this, the, the, if you send this, I will receive it. I am the owner of this prefix, okay? AS2 receives it and it's also received from a customer. You see the, the blue thing which puts the providers on top and also you have an arrow, the blue arrow from provider to customer. So it's uh, <coughs> different here, right? So AS2 says, oh, I receive announcement from my customer, so I'm going to use it. And then it is also sending it to its own customer, AS4, to its peer, AS3, this dash line is peer to peer, <coughs> and to its provider, AS5, receive it from a customer, so it will send it to everybody, right? You are making money anyway. And then AS4 receives it, AS3 receives it to, uh, and send it to its own customer, but not to its provider because it got it from a peer. AS5 is got it from a customer, so it's also sent to AS3. Okay, so these are kind of valley free routing uh, examples. Okay. okay, what is a route leak is exactly when you don't do it. When you actually do announcement, uh, receive announcement from here from your provider, but you still announce it to another provider, to AS, like 66 uh, is sending it to AS3. So that doesn't make sense because 666 is paying AS2 for traffic, and it's also paying AS3 for traffic. So if now AS3 receive this announcement, they say, oh, I want to say send some packet to this address, to address in this prefix. I'll send it to AS66. AS66 will pay for this. And when the 66 will send it to two, it again AS66 will pay for this. So why would AS6 do it? Well, it may do it. For example, if it wants to eavesdrop, then it will give it a reason to do something like this, which actually economically does not make any sense, okay? So that is what we call a route leak, and it's one of the possible attacks on the BGP. Um, yes. But uh, in this example, I mean, you, you, you didn't uh, say any difference, you explained the difference between stub and uh, transit AS. In this example, 666 is a stub domain, stub AS. Actually, we call it 666 a multi-home because it has two- Multi-home, but it's a stub, right? It's, it's a custom. Yeah. It's the bottom line customer. So it's it should not be so I, in fact it should not be carrying transit traffic by any it, means. Of course, that's exactly the point. Because if it does, then it's a it's a route leak. Exactly the point. <laughs> so this is a multi-home BS. Yes. So right. It, it has two providers. So technically it could do what but if it was mean. marked as a stub as a stub, <laughs> as the end as a leaf essentially, then both two and three would recognize that it cannot be no, in so, transit. So how could three recognize? No, so what happens is there are some defenses about against route leaks, definitely, and there are the filtering defenses. So actually many provider ASs like two and three are supposed to do exactly what Gene said. They are supposed to say, oh, but 66, you're a customer. Why do you announce to me something? So actually we do have all kinds of mechanisms that are trying to defeat okay. route leaks. Yes, definitely. Because this is a well-known, very well-known problem in secondary. And it's notice that these route leaks could also be intentional attacks, like I described, like I'm making six weeks like an attack here. I mean, these the small red, red things are supposed to be horns. I, I guess I, I'm not graphically very talented, so they probably look to, to you like ears, but they're supposed to be horns, like a, you know, like a, a devil, right? But I should just work on my graphics, right? So anyway, 66 is here, it's an attacker, but it could just be an unintentional misconfiguration Actually, the network operators have this expression for it. They call it fat fingers, right? Like you can think about this one of these network operators, and some of them are very, actually, very horrific. Uh, if you guys know network operators, not all of them, but some of them are these <laughs> horrific persons. And so fat fingers actually does make sense. And yes, yeah, so sometimes it's just a mistake, of course, but it could also be done as an attack. Now, the, the, there are other routing attacks. Because BGP basically lacks authentication. Now, BGP sessions are often authenticated between two uh, nodes, two neighbors. They are used many times, authenticated using all kinds of transport security protocols like uh, TLS or IPsec and so on. But even if we assume that they are authenticated against a many in the middle or an attacker between the two ESs, definitely the BGP protocol is, is vulnerable to an attacking AS, 
the protocol is not protecting us against not taking a S, which can do all kinds of attacks. And here we're missing the main attacks that we are considering. One basic attack is the routing that we already discussed. Here, 66 is sending announcement from AS2 to AS3, so it, that's a routing, right? That's what we do. So that's one. Another attack is prefix type X. Here you see the announcement X, so you see I used X to, to demonstrate few attacks, so that's why it's an X, okay? So if X here is 1 to 16, which is his origin, his legitimate origin is AS11, but if uh, AS66 is just sending 1 to 16 and sending itself as the origin, so that's of course a hijack, right? That's a prefix hijack. He's claiming to own the prefix, he does not own it, he's a liar. So that's a hijacking of the prefix, okay? So that's if X here is, 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 is uh, 1 to 16, 66. There is another variant, which is some prefix hijack. Actually, I show it here. When 66 is sending to S12, he's sending a sub prefix of 1 to 16. He's sending 1 to 324. So he's adding, making the network more specific, adding another part of the network address that is making it more specific. Now, there is a basic IP internet routing rule, IP protocol really rule, which says if I got two announcements, one for one to 16, one to one to three, more specific one, I will always route using the more specific one. There are good reasons for this rule, I will not have time to explain. But from our point of view, the important thing, there is this rule, basic rule of IP, okay? So one, the same is that AS12 will send traffic to this sub prefix to AS666 if we don't prevent it by some defense, and that is in spite of the fact that 66 is a provider and S12 received an announcement 1 to 16 from a peer. It would prefer. But it prefers 1 to 16 from a peer to 1 to 16 from a provider. But it does not, there is no competition between an announcement, the prefix announcement sub prefix. <laughs> the only thing is that then you end up sending to the sub prefix before you always, IP would always send to the more specific one. Okay? So, uh, what next example is, oh, origin hijack. So it's the same X that I had here, if the X was, well, again, one to 16, so it's not a subject, it's a prefix, but the path I send is 66, 11. Now 11 is the origin, so I'm claiming to have received it from 11. 66 is claiming to receive it from 11, but we see it did not receive it from 11, it received it from two. It should receive it from one, which should receive it from 11. So it should have sent us the entire path, 66, 2, 1, 11. Instead, it's saying, I receive it from 11, 66, 11. That's a lie again. Now he's hijacking the origin. He's claiming to be to have received it from the origin. That's again a lie. He did not receive it from the origin. He received it from AS2. That's a lie. Another one is path manipulation. Here, it is claiming to receive it from two and then the two is received from 11, again a lie. Two is received from one, you remove one AS from the path. Why would you do it? Well, we said that, that there is a preference for shorter path. So maybe that's why it has removed one AS from the path. So it has manipulated, changed the path in some way. There are other ways it, it may have, could have changed the path, okay? Finally, we have one attack which I did not show you as in an example, which is to change some attribute in the announcement. And the example I give you is to add a black, ball, black hole, black hole attribute. A black hole attribute means that I'm asking the, the recipient, you know, if you have traffic for that IP address, just drop it, don't send it to me, right? I mean, I have a path to the origin, but the origin is asking, don't send me traffic for that address. And of course, that is a wonderful way to get it, to do the night of service because the victim will not send you the traffic you don't even need to get the traffic and right, and you just the traffic that drop. So all, the, all of these are examples of routing attacks, uh, the, not the main routing attacks that, that we are worried about. Now the ITF has been working on this, as I said, for many years, and they did define some standards, and some of them are getting actually deployed. Uh, one very important standard that seems to be getting or is getting deployed gradually is the, the RPKI resource public key infrastructure uh, standard. Public key infrastructure is a very interesting subject which I would have loved to talk with, but the guys prefer that I will talk about routing. So here I'm talking about routing, but they couldn't prevent me. So here's a bit PKI in the, inside routing, okay? So, uh, yeah, I know, I know environment. 
So, so uh, in the RPKI, uh, so some things like that, and route origin authorization. RPKI is a mechanism to provide the owners in a certificate that shows that they actually own a particular prefix. Okay, so that's a cryptographic way to prove that you own a prefix. And once you have the prefix, you can also sign a statement called an out origin authorization or OA, which says who is allowed to announce this prefix. So you own a prefix, but you may allow some other AS to announce it, right? And maybe for some reason, for example, the CDN, so you own the prefix, but you want the CDN to announce it or something like that. So now routers that may deploy or should deploy a mechanism we call route origin validation or ROV, which is basically if I receive an announcement, and if I look at the ROA, it violates the ROA because the ROA says it should, the prefix is an, should be announced only by AS5. And here is AS666 announcing the same prefix. Then this is a bad announcement. I'm going to valid announcement. I'm going to draw. That's all. That's basically ROV. And, and that would actually immediately mitigate, prevent prefix and sub prefix hijacks that we have seen. Now, deployment of ROV is not perfect, but it is increasing. Actually, some has there been several works including myself, of measuring who is, you know, how many people are deploying ROV. And it is going up definitely. And recent estimates talk about maybe even 40% of the ASS already featuring with doing ROV, uh, doing enforcing this. If it's really 40%, then probably it's already not good for an attacker to use this prefix and sub prefix hijacking. It may be more efficient for an attacker to use some of the other attacks, okay? So we actually will focus on the scenario once ROV is sufficiently deployed to make it not to make physics and subprefix hijacking not attractive to attackers. That is what we in this talk we are focusing on in this design. Okay, so that's what we focus on. So we remove these two attacks; they are not relevant, but we still have route leaks, path manipulations, and other manipulation. These are the attacks that we are going to address. Now, there is a standard against press manipulations called BGPSEC. Uh, how does that standard work? Using cryptography. So here's the origin. I made it square. I don't know why, but I made it square this time. But it's still the origin. Yes, and here it is signing. Uh, in the announcement, it will be signing. Regular BGP does not sign. Now that we have certificates, we can, the resource certificates, we and the certificate showing that we are the origin, so we can now sign. What are we signing? We are signing that we are announcing that AS1, we are announcing the particular prefix to AS2. In a regular BGP announcement, we can uh, we actually don't write to whom do we send it because you receive it, you know who you are. <clears throat> but now we are actually signing it, so we also, in the signature, we say, and we send it to AS2. So if it's signature 2 1, meaning 1 is sending to 2, and the prefix. Very simple, okay? And two will be validating this and then adding its own signature. So this signature from two to three, signature of two, it's a public key of two, and here is the pass, I am two, I receive it from one, and I'm sending it to three. And here is also the signature that I received from one, and here is the prefix. And so that's a standard, basically. The problem is, the BGPSEC AS has downgraded to BGP. They don't continue doing BGPSEC. First of all, if they have a BGP neighbor. So if, if you, here we'll, have a, if we'll add a BGP neighbor, AS4, AS3 is sending it to regular BGP message, no signature, anything, just a regular BGP message. And AS4, of course, will also send a regular BGP message to AS5. So now the fact that AS5 is adopting and all of these we're adopting is kind of irrelevant because they are already using regular BGP. S5 is only receiving just regular BGP. Uh, and that, as a result of that, there's very, very limited benefits for partial adoption of BGP sec. Almost nothing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as the payload is progressing from node to node, so the, I mean, the system has to process it more, right? The, like the process. I mean, is there any, uh, I would like to know about the system level implications of that. You mean the processing overhead? Yeah, yeah. Yes, there is overhead. BGPSEC does have significant <laughs> overhead. And the, how this overhead is problematic is something which is arguable and there have been also works in trying to minimize the concerns. But actually we are not, in this work, we are actually not focusing on the overhead 
aspect. Also, I do think that they, we also know how to address the over the aspect, but I, I intentionally separated it to, uh, to in this work to focus on the security aspects, right? So I'm not saying that the overhead cannot be reduced. Actually, I do think it can be reduced significantly. But uh, yeah. uh, on the other hand, I do know some of the very practical network operators and people in the area who claim that the overhead is now not is not already not a problem. I, okay, so that's a, a different question. Yeah. Well, just uh, some of the uh, routers have a uh, crypto processor. So that's, uh, they, that, that, so that's why they probably say that because it's kind of negligible. So some people say we only have crypto processors. Some people say yes, but other routers not. It's a big argument between people about digital sec, but and I don't actually know. I don't have a strong position one way or the other. I do know that I know some tricks that right. I can get rid of. of uh, improve but, uh, the uh, uh, a real question I have is, is about the this. So, so basically, you're saying uh, this this is a problem in any kind of incremental deployment that is not universal. Uh, it should be said, right? If you don't have it universal, you have this problem yeah, that the, the one, one non-participant spoils it for everybody. Yes. But in this, in this example, there's no way to kind of like uh, uh, overload or abuse some field and stick all the DGP sec info in some opaque field that the four would carry to five. Oh, you could. You that is, that is part of what we are doing. Okay. Because oh. actually, the DGP right. protocol allows you to have what they call transitive attributes, okay. which you just carry on. Right. So I get to, and that is like the simplest part of our solution. It's just let's make it transitive, right? Yes. Yeah, so it's definitely okay. So, so, but let's ask the question: Why do they do it? Why do they downgrade to BGP? I mean, this seems so such crazy implications. So why did they do it? Right, so before I get to our solution, why did they do it? Yeah, okay, so first of all, they just don't relate. They could have related. There is a way, they, the way they've defined the protocol, they don't use this transitive attribute. So they could have done it. First of all, they just don't do it. In fact, there was an earlier proposal which proposed that they do it. But even if they do it, and in fact, even if that earlier proposal, SPTP, that even if they did, a, a wrong AS could just drop, yeah. still could drop the information, although it was supposed to, to relay it, it could still drop it. And uh, in, in particular, VGP SEC has no legacy, and also the previous proposal that did send this transitively, there is no, there was no registry of who is adopting, who is not adopting. But there is no reason not to have a registry these days because we do have the RPKI deployed already and available. So we should just assume that then we add to the RPKI data also a record which says, I am deploying BGPSEC. So it's like there is really no reason not to have a legacy of who is adopting BGPSEC. That's really, maybe it's, maybe you know, 20 years ago when SVGP, the old proposal was made, maybe then it was a bigger deal. But now it's not no big deal. And then they also had this concern that maybe in the yes, which is adopting, we have because of computational load, we have to stop adopting at some point. And then what do we do? So we should just accept if somebody is adopting, we should just allow that they just decide to stop adopting. And we have a simple solution to that. Uh, I'll actually tell you about it, but I don't think we even include it in the form. It's a very simple solution. Uh, I'll just say it, but when we want to explain it more. It's just that you put in your in your certificate, you also so put a hash of some pre of some value of some random pre-image, which and if you want to stop signing, you just expose this pre-image, which is like, oh, I have to stop if there is a terrible code and I cannot continue signing, and then when you recover, you will issue a new certificate. So it's really a simple solution, almost trivial solution. Uh, okay, actually a trivial solution. It is a trivial solution. So that we don't have a problem stopping signing at any time without allowing the attacker to send an announcement as if we stop signing. We all, attacker, I mean, it will only, uh, you will only accept a, my signal a message for me unsigned if you also see this pre image. That's easy. So we have the security of BGP safe, right? First, the, the security benefits are limited only to these islands of you executively adopting BGP safe. Downgrade is trivial for on path attackers, right? There is no defense against South Leaks and there is no defense uh, against uh, past attribute manipulation, yeah. the changing of the, of the attribute. So it's also computationally expensive, but that's not our focus, not in this talk. 
So that's what we are presenting, the protocol to BGP ISAC, uh, which is uh, uh, improving the security of BGP stack, especially for Apache adoption, and really minimal modification to the existing design and completely conforming with, with uh, the BGP protocol. The main modification of, of the program is really pretty simple. We first we identify the adopters and the public key in the RPC API. We prevent unauthorized downgrades. We do support downgrades, but only this, with this sort of authorization. In <coughs> usual cases, we need to downgrade. We enable partial test verification, so you don't have to, we don't verify, uh, authenticate only the entire path. You don't have, you could have this kind of AS in the middle, which is not adopting. We authenticate, integrity protect, uh, protected attributes, so attributes which are not supposed to be changing as the announcement is going forward, we actually can protect them. Uh, and we prevent route leaks. Okay, so we do all of that. And uh, let me uh, show the different mechanism or briefly talk about them. The path integrity defense is really just transitive signature. So I am here, we are really doing basically the same as BGP stack, except we are making it transitive. That's all. Route leak defenses are a bit more tricky. Um, actually, the path integrity is one more small part because we do also to protect other attributes which are included in the announcement, which can be, uh, which are either completely not changed during the propagation of the announcement, or we can kind of recover the value at any point during the, the propagation of the announcement. So I guess it's a bit more than just a, a slight. So, sorry, one, one, one quick question. Yeah. So if you had a way of marking uh, relationships as peer rather than what's peer, wouldn't that prevent route leaks? So uh, <clears throat> like you need you, to know them, right? Right, right. But if, you, if a given signer knows whether the next stop is a peer or next stop is a customer. You, but you need to uh, you verify it, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. So if you knew all the relationship in the internet. You could solve that problem. You could solve that problem, right. Okay. And right, so I will talk about okay. one proposal that already exists in the uh, in the IPF. Okay, so okay, so the routing defenses include signed OPC attributes. OPC, I will talk about it in a second, is actually an already proposal and slight partially deployed standard for protecting against accidental outlets. By simply by signing it, and since we protect, as I said, any attribute which has this property that we can recover its how it was the value of this attribute as the message propagated, and that holds for the OTC, then we are able to make it secure. So we make it secure. And we have two new mechanisms, the permitted attributes and the proconid mechanism. I'll talk briefly about them in a minute. <laughs> so, and, and look at the impact. BGP ISEC, if it's fully deployed, uh, uh, if we use the current BGP sec, Okay, then this is the, the value that it provides us. So in, instead of the possibility of interception by Montego being about 27% before adoption, if you fully adopt it, you get about 22%. So that basically is pretty disappointing return on your investment. And that also means that you have to, beginning when you adopt it, there is basically no return on your investment to adopt it. That is basically why people don't adopt BGP sec. And again, even if they would have adopted it, we wouldn't get that, bad, that much better. But with BGP ISEC, you can actually get in full adoption, you get completely rid of this interception. But the path could be different for different events. Actually, not if you only adopt this defense. This defense is not any defense against Arctic, but it is. It, here in the, this uh, kind of gray, uh, green line, this uh, terrible color here, sort of ugly color here, right? Um, so that uh, uh, you see we get in full adoption to about, I don't know, 12, 12 or 10 percent of, of uh, uh, interception, much better, but still we would like to get to zero. And we can get to zero if we also use the defenses against route leaks, okay? Uh, and if we just do the uh, signing of the OTC, which is really trivial, then we get to zero. 
But if we add these two additional mechanisms, we get even faster to reduce this interception even faster. Uh, so we we'll compare these uh, different alternatives and at least some other uh, variants uh, because when you get to a, a particle protocol like this, I mean, it's actually very hard to know what network operators will prefer. I mean, these things have their own issues, they have additional complexity and so on. So mm -hmm. we are not saying that the, the green line is the best because you are also paying for having a more complex protocol and so on. Uh, okay, but this is the signature is the <laughs> first thing. We just have to, in BGB sec, you have the transitive bit in, in the another phase to fall, so you don't send them to BGP neighbors they, they don't run BGP sec. We just turn them to true and uh, we send it to the neighbors. Uh, BG, SBGP was this old proposal that actually had it to true, but they were still not sending it to neighbors, but we are sending it to true. We send them to every, to all of our neighbors and with this bit and with uh, this extra information and that uh, we, we enforce down the down the prevention and, uh, authenticate the, the adopting subtests. <laughs> okay. So, um, so BGP sec prevents these fake downgrades because the signature are relayed by all ASs, even non-adopting ASs. And using API, we identify who is adopting. We identify the keys. So there is overhead for this because we have to verify all of the signatures. With BGP sec. Initially, you don't have overhead because you don't get the signature. So, of course, you'll get less overhead. But the overhead, if you do have adoption, uh, is the same like in BGP sec. Uh, there is, I can show it later if somebody sees. Uh, and uh, this alone is already preventing hijack of adopted origin. And it also protects the OTC anti leakage mechanism. So, let me talk about that. OTC is a very simple mechanism against leakage, similar to what you, what you basically said, a bit, a bit similar. So uh, I think it's a, it's a cool, simple mechanism. The mechanism, again, it's really working well, currently only against unintentional leakage. What does it do? There is an AS2 which is adopting this protocol. When it receives an announcement, it is simply sending in the announcement a signal, OTC, which says, Send this announcement is only to customers. Do not send this announcement to providers. So when another yes recipient knows, I should send it only to customers. If you receive an announcement from your customer, which has this bit, it means this, this was by mistake and you should not propagate. You should ignore it actually, right? So that's a very simple mechanism against these fat fingers kind of mistakes. Of course, it's not secure. Because if I'm an attacker, I can just ignore your bit. I can remove your bit. What's the problem, right? So, but by, since we authenticate the announcement, <laughs> we can. This is one of the attributes that we don't have any problem signing and authenticating because we can recover its its value. Okay, how do we recover the value? <laughs> you need to look at the details of the OTC, and you'll see that OTC <coughs> marks which was the yes that turned this OTC. So we know exactly. When should it have been as part of the announcement? When it shouldn't be? And that's not changed. Actually, the current OTC is doing it already, so we don't need to, need to change that. So we can actually sign the, the OTC and verify the OTC. And now an attacker cannot remove the OTC anymore. That's it. That was very interesting. Okay. So that's only the uh, significant uh, uh, advantage. OTC is already uh, improved, uh, already deployed, and we already get to zero interception. Okay, we have two other defenses, the app attribute, the proconic. App attribute is also a very simple defense, really. We just, in an announce, it's really similar to OTC. It's just as if we, we send an announcement to the provider, we add a, a, to the announcement a hash of a random value, some random pre-image, and the pre-image. But when you send it down to your customer, you remove the pre-image. So that basically, again, pre prevents any following AS from sending it up because they can send it up, but they don't have the pre-image, okay? So then uh, when you receive this announcement, you can actually detect that it was sent to some customer, somebody removed the pre-image. And this does help us against some attacks. You can see in the paper, some attacks that, that uh, just the uh, uh, OTC, the signed OTC by itself cannot prevent. 
uh, so that's another improvement. Yes, and the function is very efficient, so that's not a problem. And then we have the Proconic mechanism. That is the most advanced or most, uh, most complex mechanism. That mechanism has a significant requirement for deployment. And that requirement is that in S we be able to identify all of its adopting, uh, all of the adopting ASS in its provider code. Provider code means all of its providers and the providers of the providers and so on, going upwards to providers. That's the provider code. And then we need to identify all of the uh, ASS that are adopting a BGP ISEC in the provider code. Now, in practice, it's usually not so much work, and we did measure mm -hmm. how much work to do if you do it basically manually by contacting the network operators of your provider, asking them where is your provider, and they will tell you it's their provider. Whenever I talk with network operators, they, they always know their entire provider account, actually. So I don't know how much of a problem that actually is, but uh, we also measured you know, how much work it would be to do it, so it's not that terrible, but it is definitely a significant overhead uh, that, you, that this mechanism will require if people would want to adopt that one too. But it does improve our uh, defense even further. Okay, overhead. So here's our comparison with BGPSEC. As you can see, we clearly have overhead already from the beginning, but at the end, we have the same overhead as BGPSEC. Overhead is increasing as adoption increases because you have more signatures to verify, assign the same amount of signatures. In our solution, BGPSEC, you don't because if, if you send to your neighbor, neighbor is not adopting, it's usually the beginning, it wouldn't be, then you just don't do anything. So you just basically you don't do anything because you are adopting BGPSEC except telling yourself, oh, I'm adopting BGPSEC, but it doesn't actually do any impact. Right? So yes, you know that. Okay. Uh, okay. So we uh, we have kind of intuitive uh, evaluation of security, security analysis, not a proof of security, unfortunately, uh, although it is possible to do such uh, security analysis in a security provable way, but we haven't frankly done it yet. But we do show that we have some, I mean, show intuitively that we have some properties like no false positive. You will never suspect somebody of doing it disconnecting somebody because you would think they're doing an attack which they don't. We prevent all the, the visible route leaks. If you look at my paper, ask me later what do we mean by this. Uh, we show an announcement integrity under full deployment. Uh, and uh, we have a, a framework for analyzing security protocols, which we believe we should be able to turn these arguments into a precise proofs, but we haven't done it yet. Okay, so we presented this protocol as BGP ISEC. It is a set of modifications and extensions to the BGP SEC protocol to provide better security against uh, our uh, valid test manipulations uh, in uh, partial deployment. So again, focusing on attacks which are not trying to circumvent our B, not criticizing things or sub criticizing because these should be defended by, by our B. We provide defense against route leaks and defense against active implementation. It's not yet a complete proposal. It's a basis for building, you know, uh, making an action protocol because uh, I, as you know, also I think there's some experience that working with the ITF is a long, long process, right? Uh, so, right. So, but we will be working, we are contacting people with ITF for taking forward. Actually, I'm probably going to take it forward after we also have the, the efficiency part, right? I'm going to get into this more in, do we need efficiency or not. I'm going to get into this efficiency. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. That's before. Yeah. Uh, so who authorizes the downgrading? Oh, the, the, you, the, the owner of the prefix. So if you have the prefix, you have your own certificate, right? So it's just it's building certificate, you put this uh, hash of the random number. So when you want to say, I cannot sign because uh, 
to try out, right? Let me just expose the PE and see the same thing that now it's so Only you can do it. You probably won't have the green as well, so we start it. No, no, it, we're starting it with just but you don't your need certificate. To, but you don't need to. You could have done it with yet another pre image. You but could have done with another. It would be way right. simpler. Yeah, but then I, and then what do you do next time? You do put it No, no, but at least you can do this twice. One stop you and could, restart. Yes, you could and then see. speaking of pre images, there was a slide of pre image, a different type of image in your solution. Yes. Right? right. What if there are pre images delete, deleted? Yeah. Maliciously, why it should be propagated, but it's deleted. Signature, so yeah. we would detect signature. That you, not the pre image, I mean, a, no, no, not the pre image, the im. The route is propagated with the pre image to the, to the provider, right? Yes. Right. It's not supposed to be propagated to the customer, right? Mm -hmm. But what if somebody deletes as it's propagated to the provider, somebody deletes the pre image? But this just makes it, the, the announcement appears to be, so then the provider should ignore it. Okay. So that's a denial of service. Wait, but you're you're in the past, so you could have just not sent the announcement. So, like we said, you don't have to send the announcement. So, okay. not really a denial of service. Yes, but but actually, the, I will admit that this uh, mechanism of this pre-image it does rely on the fact that the attacker will not be able to see the pre-image, right? So this is this is not true because of pairwise uh, secure channel there. Yes, and, and if you have a malicious CS in the middle, then they can clearly actually get the screen and then use it later on. Right. So, yes. Mm -hmm. The whole uh, science is public keys. This was not part of your uh, oh, question. The certificates exactly. themselves, right? Uh, yes. yes. So that is part of the RPKI. So there, there is something like uh, half is not seeing where uh, every, uh, if you own a specific IP prefix or if you have an ASN number, then there are these organizations which no, give the control of this space of IP addresses and the space of ASN numbers that they give to the law. So yeah, that sounds so good, right? Yeah. Any other questions? Somewhere I wrote some Next speaker again. Thank <laughs> you.